Thanks for joining me. We're going to be going through an old exam. This can give you a sense of what to expect on the next exam. Now, we don't repeat exam problems, but as they say, you know, while they may not repeat, it often rhymes. So in other words, by looking at problems and old exams, we get a sense of what to expect. And that's what we want. We want you to see, hey, these are the type of problems to expect, maybe somewhere around the level of difficulty. Here are some good ideas to know and some good things to do, and maybe some good things not to do. If you haven't taken this test yet, you should stop here, take the test, and come back. If you have and you're ready to look at it, you can also skip ahead by clicking in the right place in the video. So there's places that you can select just the problem that you want. Of course, you can also watch it from beginning to end. Who doesn't like watching people do math? It's a fantastic pastime. Well, let's get going. Find the particular solution of cosine x equals y sine x minus cosine x dy dx, y of 0 equals 2. We automatically spot this is an initial value problem because we have an initial value. So, okay, so we're going to have to find uh, the solution for B of C, we have to solve for C. One of the things we want to get comfortable with is recognizing what type of problem we have. We see there's a single derivative involved, a dy dx, which means, all right, so it's first order. Now, first order, there's basically a couple of options. You've got uh, separable, linear, first order, which means integrating factors. You've got exact, and you've got wildcard, substitution. So you want to know how to recognize that. Now, one of the things that they might do is write it in a way to throw you off the scent. So you might not be used to having them write a dy dx. And keep in mind, dy dx and y prime are the same. You can swap them one for another. So for instance, we could have written this as cosine of x equals y sine of x minus cosine of x y prime. Now in this format, it's a little bit easier for me at least to see, oh, I have something multiplying by y prime, something multiplying by y, and they're in a linear combination. So this is a first order linear problem. Okay, good. So now we've identified it, we work to solve it. So they wrote it in a very unusual way. Well, at least what I think is a very unusual way. But remember, we can choose to rewrite it. In fact, that's oftentimes a good first step is to say, hey, how should this be written? Now, in this case, what I'd like to do is I'd like to move it, the y prime and the y on one side, the cosine x on the other side. And so let me just start there. So you have cosine of x, y prime, subtract, sine of x, y, equals minus cosine of x. The other thing is we need to get a 1 in front of y prime, because that's what the technique says to do. So we can do the following. We can divide everything by cosine of x. And we'll see what we get. And if we do that, we get y prime minus tangent of x y is equal to minus 1. So, well, now we're ready to talk about integrating factors. Okay, so to do this, we say, all right, grab what's in front of the y, and we're going to integrate that function. Now, it turns out this is a, a nice function. It's one that we know. So the integral of tangent is log secant. There's a minus sign. So actually, this becomes minus log secant is log cosine x. So our integrating factor is e to the log cosine of x, which means it's cosine of x. OK, so if we now multiply through by cosine x, we're going to get cosine of x y prime minus tangent times cosine is sine of x y equals minus cosine x. And at this point, you're probably thinking, oh, 
<laughs> That's what we started with just a few minutes ago. Do we really have to go through this? Well, it can be you might have an epiphany. You might be looking at this and be like, ah, and you might say, aha, the light bulb is going to turn on. And so if you're able to look at this problem and say, hey, I recognize what this problem is. This is a already set up as a derivative, you know, then that's fine. So in other words, you say, ah, the right hand side or the left hand side was a derivative all the time. If you don't see that, do the process. Either way, you're fine. All right, so what do we get? Well, the left hand side by design, it's going to be the derivative of the integrating factor cosine x times y. And that's most of the work. The rest of the work is just the fun part. We actually integrate both sides. And did you ever think when you were taking calc 1 and calc 2, they say, ah, integrate, that's the fun part. Well, that's what math does to us, right? We learn to enjoy it. So we get cosine of x times y. The integral of cosine, well, is sine. Don't forget about the minus sign. So that's minus sine of x. And then, of course, plus some constant c. Now, we can solve for our c. We have, you can see it right here at the top, y of 0 equals 2. So if I put in x equals 0 and y equals 2, well, what happens? We'll get cosine of 0, which is 1, times 2. So we get 2 equals sine of 0, 0 plus c. So I say, aha, c needs to be 2. Now, since it says find, we really do want to go all the way and get y by itself. So we're ready. Sine over cosine would make this tangent. Don't forget the minus sign. And then 1 over cosine is secant. C is 2. So plus 2 secant. And there we go. There we go. All right. Well, not so bad. A nice warm-up problem. Usually they like to make the first problem a little bit more straightforward. Hopefully they'll all be straightforward once you've practiced, right? That's the goal. That's the goal. The second problem. Find the general implicit solution of the differential equation dy dx equals 6 times y squared plus xy divide by 3x squared plus 4xy. And now we look at this and say, huh, hmm, huh. Now, sometimes when you see implicit, that can be a clue that it might be exact. And let's actually go ahead and, and try that out, right? I mean, it doesn't hurt to try. If it were exact, what we could do is we could write it as something times dx and something times dy. So this is our check if exact. And a lot of this we can do in our heads, but at least the first step, we might as well work this out. 6y squared plus xy dx, right? Just multiplying there. Here, I'd multiply, but then I'd bring it across, minus 3x squared, 3x squared plus 4xy dy. Now, can this be exact, and why not? Well, the problem here is when we integrate, for example, this term, we'll have integral of 6y squared x. But over here, there's nothing that's going to integrate that's going to be a positive. They're both negatives. So we say, ah, dang it, not exact. Okay, so, well, there is always the dream. Always the dream. Okay, so it's not exact. It's not going to be separable because there's no real way to, to factor the x and y out. Uh, at least not yet. Who knows what the future holds. It's not linear first order because there's higher powers of y, that y squared. Okay, so, uh, so that's 
we're really losing possibilities. So we're in our wild card substitution option. Now this is one of two types of substitutions that we'd like you to be able to do without being prompted. So it is a substitution problem. And this one in particular is homogeneous. And the reason we can see that is everything here is of the same power. All right, so like great. So we're gonna go through and carry this out. Now, when we have something that's homogeneous, what we like to do is we like to say, okay, we're gonna make the substitution y over x equals our new symbol, let's call it v. But it's sometimes easier to say, hey, we can really write this as y equals x times v. Now, I'm gonna do things slightly differently than may have been done in class, but I think this is probably a little bit easier. Now, remember the goal of substitution. Everything, everything is gonna get substituted. You know, the whole nine yards. So everywhere where there's a y, we replace it. So we think of y as what we're replacing. And uh, everywhere where there's a y prime, we also have to replace that as well. Since y equals x times v, y prime, product rule will be v plus x v prime. Now, let's go through and do our replacement. So, we have v plus x v prime equals 6. y squared, well, I replace y. So, it'll become x v squared plus x times y, which is x v. Divide that by, downstairs, 3x squared plus 4x times x v. All right, so far so good. We've now gotten rid of the y's completely. We replaced the y prime and every other place there was a y, it got substituted. Okay, so what happens? Well, if you look, you'll notice we're going to get an x squared, x squared, x squared, x squared. So you can actually factor out an x squared on the top. You have 6, and you have v squared, and here plus v. Downstairs, when we factor an x squared out, we're going to be left with 3 plus 4 All right, great. And we're like, aha, the x squared cancel. Now, the reason I like doing it this way is normally we say, oh, write everything in terms of y over x and then make the substitution. But then you have to be like, ah, how do you get everything in terms of y over x? Here, you don't even have to think about it. You just do it. Isn't that great? I like it. I like it. And you'll notice that actually we're in really good shape. In fact, look, there's just a single x. That's pretty good. And when you can get down to just like one x, that means you're gonna be able to do a lot of things to simplify. Usually it means separable. So it is separable. Ha, see, if you waited long enough, things would work out. We're gonna start by moving that v across. So let's write this, x v prime is equal to we have 6 times v squared plus v over 3 plus 4v subtract v. Now, we want to combine them together. So, the way we'll do that is we'll get a common denominator. So, 3 plus 4v over 3 plus 4v. So, that'll be here, be 6v squared plus 6v. And then we're going to have minus 3v, right? You see minus 3v and minus 4v squared. All that divide by 3 plus 4v. Now, well, if we are lucky, things will simplify. 6v squared subtract 4v squared is 2v squared. 6v subtract 3v is plus 3v and then we get 3 plus 4v. All right, and now that 
is equal to xv prime. So we rearrange and we get 3 plus 4v divide by 2v squared plus 3v dv is equal to 1 over x dx. Now, the good news is one of these two sides is easy to do. The other side is slightly less easy, but not too bad. It looks intimidating, but looks can be deceiving. So you might say, aha, well, I know the side that was the easy side. That's the one over X. Yeah, that is. And uh, so we can integrate that and that'll be nice. But this side, while it looks bad, look at what you have. 2V squared plus 3V. What's the derivative of that? Well, it'll be 4V plus 3, which is up here. So in other words, if you set this to be U, this is DU. And so we end up with a 1 over U DU. So that turns out that the left-hand side is the natural log of 2V squared plus 3V. Right-hand side, natural log of x, and of course, don't forget c. Well, let's get rid of our, our logs. We'll take both sides, plug it into the exponential function, and when we do that, we come to our conclusion that 2v squared plus 3v is equal to cx. Remember, e to the log x, e to the c, then e to c is a constant. We're almost done. We've done all the hard part. The reason we're not fully done is V was not part of our original problem. We introduced V. So we've got to go back. So we now say, ah, V is Y over X. So we would say two Y over X squared plus three Y over X is equal to C times X. If you multiply through by x squared, then we won't have any fractions left. 2y squared plus 3. Here, there's only a single x, so that'll be xy equals cx cubed. And there we go. That's it. That's the general answer. And, uh, wow, that was kind of nice. Kind of nice. Now, of course, the hard part was knowing how to begin. That's almost always the hard part on all problems. And I know you're like, ah, how will I know what to do? Just start going through and saying, is it this, is it that, is it that? And uh, if you're worried about, what about substitutions? There's gonna be three basic things substitutions will take a form of. One is it's homogeneous. A second is Bernoulli. The third is, we will tell you. So that's it. Homogeneous, Bernoulli, we will tell you. Because, you know, it can be a little bit subtle. But, uh, all right, good. Ended up working out nicely. Our next problem. Check if y1 equals x squared and y2 equals x squared log x are solutions of x squared y double prime minus 3xy prime plus 4y equals 0. And then there's a second part. The second part, use the Ronskian to check if y1 and y2 are linearly independent. If yes, write the general solution. Now, this word check, I will say, is another way to say verify. So it's nice to say, ah, verify. So keep in mind, we use uh, you know, synonyms, words that have the same meaning. So be on the lookout. So verify problems are pretty straightforward. What do you do? You plug them in. That's how every verify problem goes. Now you might say, oh, aren't we supposed to derive the answers? You would get full credit, but it's a lot more work. Verifying is very straightforward. You don't have to derive the answers. Life is good. All right, so let's begin. We have two functions, so we'll start with y1. And because we're going to plug it in, we need to take the derivatives. So derivative of x squared is 2x, and the derivative of 2x is 2. So 
we have x squared y1 double prime. Whoops, x squared. <laughs> yeah, I know. Be careful, be careful. It's so easy, especially when you're on a test. Your math adrenaline is just pumping hard. y1 double prime is 2. And you're like, wow, I'm just going to try to speed through it. y1 prime is 2x. Don't try that. Take your time. Enjoy it. These are the best years. You get to take math tests on a regular basis. My goodness, someday you'll get old. You won't get to do math tests anymore. Ah, what a terrible, terrible future. All right, so 2x squared minus 6x squared plus 4x squared equals 0. And that's it. That's the verify. See, we're not asking for a lot. You just plug it in and make sure it works. But of course, that's just one function. There's a second function. So we go to our second function, y2, x squared log x. Now, here it's going to be slightly more interesting product rule. The derivative of the first times the second plus the first x squared times the derivative of the second. Now, the derivative of log is 1 over x. x squared times 1 over x is x. And then we go to our second derivative. So the derivative of the first is 2 times the second is log. Plus the first, which is 2x, times the derivative of log x. Well, that's 2x times 1 over x, which is 2. And we have the derivative of x, which is 1. So we have 3. So 2 log x plus 3. Now we go through again. So x squared, plugging in the second one, minus 3x, the second one, 4y2, uh, equals x squared times 2 natural log x plus 3. One thing that you can make a mistake in, of course, is do them in the backwards order. So make sure the second derivative goes with the second derivative, first derivative goes with the first derivative, and so forth and so on. And uh, the other nice thing, though, whoops, yeah, this is definitely, it takes a lot more space. The other nice thing is that these problems are pretty much, you can check, right, if you did it right or not. What do I mean? Well, what I mean is you go to the end and you see, did you get zero or did you not get zero? If you did not get zero, mistakes were made. So you should fix those mistakes. But if you did get zero, then that means, okay, I probably did something right. Well, yeah. I mean, you signed up for differential equations, so you probably did do something right. Let's look at our functions. We have x squared log x. Let's gather. There's a 2 there. Here, we'll get minus 6. Oops. Here, we'll get plus 4. And then we have an x squared. And here, we have 3. And here we have minus 3. And we say, well, 2 minus 6 plus 4 equals 0. 3 minus 3 equals 0. 0, 0, 0. And life is good. All right. So that was the first part. Again, these problems aren't very hard. They're not even that time consuming, but they take pro time. There's a process. Follow the process. Find your derivatives. Plug it in. Life is good. Bob's your uncle, as the saying goes. Now, the next sentence, use the Ron scheme to check if they're linearly independent. So we're going to do a Ron scheme. So we have x squared, x squared log x. So we're setting up our determinant. We have our functions. Then we have our derivatives. Now, we don't actually have to think hard. We actually found the derivatives already. So we can just copy. And... Now we remember we have our chum, chum, right? So this is going to be x squared times 2x log x plus x subtract other direction, 2x times x squared log x. And if you look, you get a 2x cubed log x. Here's another 2x cubed log x, but being subtracted. So those cancel, 
And then there's an x squared times x, which leaves us with x cubed, which is not zero. And so they're linearly independent. All right. So they are linearly independent. Good. Now, the last part says, well, if yes, and they are, write the general solution. And so this is just saying, hey, did you understand superposition? So superposition says, oh, look, if I have two linearly independent solutions, then my general solution looks like some multiple times my first function plus some multiple times the second function. And that's it when it comes to writing the general solution. And we're done. That's the whole problem. So not too bad. A little bit of work. But uh, other than having to write down a lot, it should be mostly automatic. You know, that's our goal. Our goal is to just make it flow. Flow. It'll be great. The fourth problem. The differential equation dx dt, which is 2x times 6 minus x, subtract 16, which is also negative 2 times x minus 2 times x minus 4. So they did a lot for us. They factored it for us. They're so nice. Oftentimes they won't do that. We'd have to do that ourselves. But you know, it's okay. Take what you can. All right. So anyways, it can be used to model the population in thousands of a certain species of fish in a lake from which fishes are harvested at a constant rate every year. You can kind of see it, right? The 2x times 6 minus x, that's a logistic model, which is really good for modeling populations. And then you say, OK, that's just the natural population. And then this minus 16 is that's the effect of harvesting. All right, so part A, find and classify each critical point as stable, unstable, or semi-stable also draw the phase plane. And here I'm going to assume the phase plane means the phase diagram. So it's, it's one dimensional. All right. So, well, first off, uh, the fine. So part A. Well, you set dx dt equals zero. And that means you have minus two times x minus two times x minus four equals zero. Well, okay. The only way it can be zero is if one of these pieces is zero. And so our critical points are at 2 and 4. OK, that's the find. The classify, well, to classify, I'm going to skip ahead and draw the phase diagram. All right, so we mark 2 and we mark 4. And now what we start doing is we start plugging in values for x. And so we can plug in any values for x which are convenient. Now, we can, for example, use either one of these equations. If we plug in, say, x equals 0, we see that the dx dt is negative. So that says x prime is negative here, going to the left. Plug in, say, 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. Again, we have negative 16, so x prime is again negative. So we're going to be going down again. And then plug in 3. Well, I'll plug it in here. 3 minus 2, positive 3 minus 4 is negative. There's a negative out front. All combined, you see it's positive, which means it's going to go to the right. And so we see, aha, 2, we're moving away. So we're going out from it. So it's pushing it out. So that's unstable. 4, we see we're going in. So that would be stable. And we're done with part A. Okay, so now we can talk about part B. If x of 0 equals 3, what happens to x of t as t goes to infinity? Well, the real question is, what's the long-term behavior? Well, we just say, where's 3? It's right there, between 2 and 4. And we say, aha, if I'm between 2 and 4, then what's going to happen is I'm going to follow the arrow to the critical point. And so the answer is 4, right? Because I see 
uh, I'll draw it again. There's two, four, here's three. And so we just follow the arrow. So the answer is four. Follow the arrow. And uh, that's it. So actually, yeah, questions like, where do you go? Depend on where you start. Once you have the phase diagram, it's pretty much instant. It's wonderful. That's why we like to draw the phase diagram. It makes problems easy. Ah, oh, don't you wish this was on the test? Well, they had it on the test last time. So who knows? It might be something similar this time. Maybe. Maybe. Our next problem. Consider the following initial value problem for a spring mass dash pot system. So dash pot, remember, is just a way to say damper. So spring mass damper. 3x double prime plus cx prime plus 3x equals 0. x of 0 equals minus 2. x prime of 0 equals 3. So part A. Find the value of the damping constant C that makes the spring critically damp. Now, the reason that you'll often see things being critically damped is because they're sort of like a unique C. But there's also practical reasons why you might want something to be critically damped. So it's not that unusual a question. All right, so we'll start there. So part A. So what we're going to do is say, okay, what does critically damped mean? Well, in some sense, we can say, ah, oh, it's that, that sweet dividing line between places where there's oscillation versus just exponential. And, but really, we say, ah, this is when our roots are repeated. That's what it boils down to. We have repeated roots for the algebra problem that the differential equation corresponds to. So say, okay, well, let's start with the differential equation problem. And then we can turn it into the algebra problem. And now we say, okay, we solve for our roots and we have, well, our roots would be minus the middle term plus minus the square root, middle term squared, minus 4ac all over 2 Now, we need the part that's inside the square root. This part really is what determines things like, is it overdamped, is it underdamped, is it critically damped, is there no damping? It all comes down to what happens here. If we want critical damping, we need that to be zero. So we say, oh, well that says c squared has to equal four times three times three, which is another way to say 36. And so C needs to equal 6. And that's it for part A, because the part A it says find the value of the damping constant C. That was it. Now, that's not so bad, right? Well, it's not meant to be bad. It's meant to say, do you know things? And if you know them, can you do things with them? So now we're ready for part B. So what does part B ask? says, hey, for the value of c and a, find the solution x of t. Now, we already know c equals 6, so we say, ah, we have 3x double prime plus 6x prime plus 3x equals 0, and we were told x of 0 equals negative 2, and that x prime of 0 equals 3. But, hey, we've already went through and found the roots, right? And we said, oh, the roots should be 6. Oh, sorry, our damping constant should be 6, which says that goes away, and then our roots will be minus c over 6. So we see, aha, that says our roots are minus 1 and minus 1. All right, well, we know how to translate that. That means that x of t is a e to the minus t plus repeated roots bumping gets involved b t e to the minus t 
x prime of 0, well, minus a e to the minus t, plus here we'll get uh, product rule b e to the minus t, and minus b t e to the minus t. This minus and that minus both coming from the same place, it's the derivative of e to the minus t. Oh, sorry, not x prime of 0, x prime of t. Now, plug in x of 0, well, a and 0. So you get a equals minus 2. And then x prime of 0 should be what? Well, minus a, so but we know what a is. So minus a is 2 plus b and minus 0. That should equal 3. So that says, hey, b needs to be 1. So putting them in, we see our answer is x of t is minus 2 e to the minus t plus t e to the minus t. And that's it. We're done. We're done. Because we found the solution. And uh, yeah, we even got to do a little bit of recycling, which is good. And repeated roots know how to handle repeated roots. Yeah, life is good. Life is wonderful. Time for our final problem. Solve the following initial value problem. y double prime plus 2y prime plus 10y equals 10. y of 0 equals 2. y prime of 0 equals negative 1. All right. Well, let's uh, see what happens. Now, we start with the homogeneous part. So we have y double prime plus 2y prime plus 10y equals 0. So that becomes r squared plus 2r plus 10 equals 0. Now, probably not looking good for factoring. I can't think of two numbers that are both positive that multiply to 10 but add to 2, which is what we would need if it were factored. But we can do other things. So one thing we can do is we can do completing the square. r squared plus 2r plus what would give us a perfect square? Well, plus 1. But we have a plus 10, so that would make that plus 9. Or we could say, aha, that's really r plus 1 squared. That's equal minus 9. And then we say, hey, that tells us what's happening. Square root of minus 9 will give us 3i plus and minus, and then the minus 1 comes across. So we end up with r is minus 1 plus minus 3i. All right. Well, that tells us that our parts of our homogeneous part, the complementary solution part, if you will, the minus 1 will be in the exponential. The 3 will go into the sine and cosine. So we're going to have e to the minus x. Uh, whoops, I forgot to put an a here. e to the minus x cosine 3x e to the minus x sine 3x. All right. Well, now, the next part is to say, what about the particular solution? Because if you look at this, you'll notice we start with the homogeneous solution, but we have a 10 here, which means that this is not a homogeneous problem. So we need to look at the particular part say, well, okay, what should the particular part look like? Well, we think, hmm, it should look like a constant, because there's a constant, and that's it. We say, well, is there a constant showing up in the homogeneous? And there's not, so there's no need to bump. So I say, okay, so that's what the particular solution should look like. And we, we take the derivatives here. They're like, ooh. So when we plug it in, we see that y double prime plus 2y prime plus 10y. So plugging in our particular solution, we get 0 plus 2 times 0 plus 10 times c, which is 10c. And that should equal 10. We're like, ah, I know what that means. That means c should be 1. So 
our punchline here is now we have that our particular solution is 1. All right, good news. We found our homogeneous complementary solution, and we found our particular solution. So we're doing great. We can now say that our general solution is what happens when you add these two together. So that would be 1 plus something e to the minus x cosine 3x plus something e to the minus x sine 3x. And we'd be ecstatic if we were asked to find the general solution because then we could box it. But you'll notice that we have initial values. So we're not done. Just when you thought you were done. The problem pulls you back in. All right. So, say no worries. We know how to handle that. So we have y. We'll also need y prime. Well, the derivative of 1 is 0. Here we have a pair of product rules. So we'll get uh, minus a e to the minus x cosine 3x. And then the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Don't forget the 3. So minus 3a e to the minus x sine 3x. And then we ran out of space. So the next line, minus b e to the minus x sine 3x. And the derivative of sine is plus cosine. Don't forget the 3. So plus 3b e to the minus x cosine 3x. All right. Well, we plug in y of 0 equals 2, because that's what we were told. So we do what we're told, right? You should. It's a good strategy. E equals 1. e to the 0 times cosine of 0 is 1, so plus a. e to the 0 times sine of 0 is 0, and so that's that. So 2 equals 1 plus a. We say, hey, good news. We know what a is. a is 1. Now, the next part, we plug in. y prime of 0 equals minus 1, because that's what we were told. Well, what does that equal? Well, we get minus a, and then times 1, times 1. So that's minus a, but a is 1, so that's minus 1. Minus 3a times 1 times 0, 0. Minus b times 1 times 0, 0 plus 3b, and then times 1 times 1. All right, so minus 1 equals minus 1 plus 3b. So I said, oh, b is 0. So now we know a and b. So the last thing is we put them in. And we come to the conclusion that y is equal to 1 plus e to the minus x cosine 3x. And we're done. That's it. That's the answer. Wow! We fit it all in. Amazing. Ah, amazing. Well, I hope you were able to do all these problems, and I hope you're getting that confidence. The more confidence you get, then that's better for you, right? Because we don't want you to go in scared. We don't want you to be afraid of these tests. We want you to go in excited and be like, I am so ready to show all the great things that I have learned. We believe in you. We want you to be wonderful. And most of all, we want you to be great.